So it's my pleasure to introduce Peter McMahon, uh, a professor of, uh, at Cornell University. We should also congratulate Peter because he just became a Packard fellow yesterday. So it's a pleasure to have you here, Peter, and looking forward to your talk. Great, well, uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction and uh, for putting this all together to you know, all the organizers and the committee. Uh, it's a really fantastic workshop. And my, the, the, the title that I normally give my, my talk for the past kind of six months or so is the one shown up in gray here. And I've had to give it a new title this time because if I gave it that title, it would be too boring. It would be almost the same as the title of the workshop. So this workshop really is very, very aligned with the work, the, at least a large portion of the work that we are, uh, we're, we're doing in my lab. Uh, so this is very, very timely. So uh, I, I think uh, Shanway is uh, always a, a very tough act to follow. Um, but in this occasion, uh, maybe I'm grateful to do so because uh, we didn't coordinate beforehand, but I think actually we have very complimentary talks. Uh, so. Uh, I was very happy to see uh, uh, some kind of things in his talk that I hadn't seen before, but also there's a bunch of work in his talk that is uh, very kind of connected with, uh, with what we are doing. So like the, uh, the new, more detailed for this conference only or workshop only revised uh, uh, title, most of what I will talk about today is how we can use backpropagation to make neural networks out of any physical system. Um, but I will also talk a little bit about uh, some work that's not exactly related to this, that's in the sort of broader context of uh, computing with physical systems and in particular with optical systems. So before I dive into the, the technical material, I would of course like to acknowledge the members of the group who actually did the work. Uh, I'm just here to do the advertising um, and I'll try to highlight individual people as we go along. Uh, and also to the funding agents who supported the, the work that I'll talk about today, uh, both NTT Research and the NSF. So the, the grand plan is I'll have a very brief introduction that will mirror some of uh, Shanghui's introduction and some of the introductions we've seen in previous talks today, uh, but with a focus on the parts that are gonna be maybe a little different in, in what I will tell you about. And then the, uh, the main course is gonna be on uh, physical neural networks and how we can uh, use uh, basically a set of procedures that we've we've uh, we've been testing for how you can turn pretty much any physical system into a neural network, uh, and we'll I'll show you some of the initial experimental results that we have from this kind of methodology. I'll also spend a little bit of time near the end of this time to tell you some work we've been doing on somewhat more conventional optical neural networks, um, explicitly trying to construct matrix vector multiplications uh, that will also connect with a a part of what uh, of Shanghai's talk. Uh, and this I won't go into in detail, but the kind of highlight of this will be that we've been able to demonstrate optical neural networks using optical matrix vector multipliers where we use less than a single photon per weight multiplication, which at first might sound a little crazy of how is that even possible, but uh, I'll, I'll try to explain how that works and show you uh, uh, the performance that we've been able to achieve. So then, um, I'd like to kind of quickly touch on uh, or some get some sort of uh, nomenclature or uh, context uh, out of the way so that everyone uh, understands where we're coming from and kind of the a very crucial distinction and of course building computing uh, physical systems for doing machine learning computation uh, is this distinction in machine learning between inference and training that uh, we've already heard about earlier uh, but just to quickly say it again in 20 seconds, inference is, of course, the business of you're given some new unseen data and you're asking the computer or the system to produce a prediction for you. Uh, whereas training is uh, you're given some large data set and you want to produce a model that would then be used repeatedly in an inference phase. And the main reason I bring this up is that uh, in this talk, we are going to mostly be focusing on inference. Um, it's absolutely true that training is also an important problem to try uh, do faster and do more energy efficiently, but just so that whenever you're seeing the things I'm talking about and wondering, well, how would that improve training? Uh, don't. Think about how will it improve inference, because the, the two things I'm going to, the main things I'm going to tell you about today are about improving energy efficiency or speed or both of inference. Why is it relevant to think about inference? Well, one of the 
uh, kind of intuitions you can have is that if you have a machine learning engineer that builds a machine learning model, this can be deployed to the cloud and then be used. This model can be used in inference mode by hundreds of thousands or even millions of users. Uh, and this leads to uh, these kind of numbers that people sometimes give of 80 to 90% of the total cost of machine learning in hardware cost as well as energy cost uh, is due to inference in large scale uh, models. And this is kind of consistent across a number of different companies of Amazon, Nvidia, McKinsey, et cetera, all come up with a similar sort of estimate of the percentage of inference. So even though we're only tackling inference and at least the things in this talk, uh, that's still uh, not a not a, far from a trivial sort of part of the, the overall energy consumption. So uh, again, just to very re, uh, very quickly kind of recap the the picture of neural networks, so that at least the notation in my slides will be familiar to you. Uh, although I'm sure yeah, the concepts are already familiar. If we're trying to do inference and make a prediction of is what is this handwritten digit given as an image? This is an eight. Uh, the a canonical way to do this is we think about having a feed forward neural network where you feed the image into an input layer of neurons. Uh, each, for example, each pixel could be input to a different neuron and then it propagates through this neural network and then there's an output layer of one or more neurons, typically more than one, um, where you uh, receive your answer. And in a standard sort of artificial neural network setting, the propagation of information from one layer to the next may be governed by matrix vector multiplication, where you can think about each layer of, of neurons as a vector. And then you go from one layer to the next by uh, performing a matrix multiplication to that vector where the matrix encodes these kind of weights and connections between neurons, between layers. Uh, and then with, again, as everyone knows, and as, as was also explicitly mentioned in the previous talk, uh, we have typically on-site or element-wise nonlinearities that are applied at each stage before you uh, go on and do the, net, the propagation through the next set of layers. So given that that kind of structure for a neural network, one typically has sort of two options for building neural network hardware accelerators. Uh, and I think you, you could basically break them into categories of exact and approximate mathematical equivalents. So what I mean by that is we have some neural net, artificial neural network structure that is familiar to kind of all machine learning or neural network engineers. And you could say, well, we can try to build an accelerator that has an exact mathematical equivalence to this structure. It will do exactly the operations that you see there. So it will do exactly the matrix vector multiplication you want, as well as exactly the nonlinearity you want. And the main advantage of doing this kind of thing is that, or of this approach of building a, an accelerator that has an exact equivalence is that you can now take a model that was trained on a CPU or a GPU or a TPU, for example, and just sort of drop it in to your new hardware accelerator and it will work because there's an exact mathematical equivalence. The disadvantage of doing this is that you then need to really carefully engineer the hardware so that it has the exact equivalence. And typically, if you have to really carefully engineering, engineer the hardware, you, need, you will have to sort of leave some energy efficiency on the table for the sake of getting the accuracy. So an alternative approach or perspective is that you could build an accelerator that doesn't try to have an exact equivalence with, the, with this, that it could just do things approximately equivalent. And the advantage of, the, of making it only have an approximate mathematical equivalence is that your hardware can now be made more energy efficient in principle because you don't have to engineer it as hard. Um, the, diff, the, the con of this is that now a model that was trained assuming this mathematical structure, if you just try to drop it into a piece of hardware that doesn't exactly match that mathematical structure or, or exactly uh, implement those mathematical operations, uh, the model won't work properly. So you will need to retrain your models at least somewhat. You might not have to start from scratch. You might be able to st start from the model trained on a CPU and then tweak it a bit. But nevertheless, you're gonna require some retraining uh, because the, the model was trained for something that the, the, the inference hardware was then a little different. And the main part of my talk is going to be describing an accelerator that falls into this sort of framework of this approximate equivalence. Uh, but and at the end, I'll also tell you about our approach with optical matrix vector multipliers, where we're really trying to do something much more like this, where we're aiming for an exact equivalence. I've also set up this dichotomy between exact and approximate, because those are terms that are familiar to people and, and kind of harken to the mathematics, but 
I don't want you to think about approximate as really being only like if you're doing the matrix vector multiplication, but just there's a little bit of numerical imprecision. Uh, it turns out that that's not, not even necessary. You can make accelerators that are just sort of vaguely inspired by this structure. And we've already seen some examples of this from Shanhui's talk um, in, the, in the last speaker slot. So uh, approximate doesn't, doesn't have to mean really close. It can mean even just sort of, it's roughly following the kind of structure. Uh, and that's sufficient. So now into the sort of main, uh, main set of work, which is we've been inspired by this idea of, of building uh, neural networks out of physical systems. And we would like to try and take a given physical system that might be very energy efficient and turn it into a neural network. But how do we, how do, we do that? So this work was led by two postdocs in my group, Logan Wright and Tatsuhiro Onodera, and they were assisted by and a junior PhD student, Martin Stein. So the, the kind of goal of this overall, this, uh, this part of the talk overall is we would like to tackle the problem of performing inference energy efficiently. And the intuition and kind of promise that we, we have is sort of inspiration from Feynman and Feynman's motivation for proposing quantum computers, which was that if you, have a, a, a quantum system, it's really difficult to, to simulate on a classical computer. So why, why not uh, take the, the quantum system and build computers out of that? And then somehow you should be able to, to naturally build computers that are more powerful. And we've taken this sort of similar reason, which is certainly not unique to us. People in this community have been making similar arguments for, for 20 plus years. Um, but that's very inspirational to us is that there are many physical systems that are expensive to simulate on a digital computer that are not quantum. Um, they, they're classical systems that are really hard to simulate on a digital computer just because they exhibit complex behavior. And uh, you can imagine things like large networks of coupled oscillators can already be hard to simulate, but kind of maybe more visually. Uh, you can imagine something like uh, Navier-Stokes equations being used to model airflow over a car in this case. Um, being very expensive to simulate something that in the physical world, if you just take a car and you put it in a wind tunnel, it will do this computation in sort of a fraction of a second, whereas to do this really accurately on a digital machine, you may require a large and powerful machine performing many computations over minutes or hours. So the, in the sort of same Feynman-esque way, you can say, well, why can, can we turn the situation around? And if there are physical systems that are really hard to simulate classically, can we somehow take those physical systems and harness what they're intrinsically doing uh, to perform expensive computations for us? And there's a major challenge, even if we don't say, let's make and try and make arbitrary computers, how do we even take an arbitrary physical system and make it behave as a neural network? It's a subset of computing, but it's an important subset. But even that is, it's not so obvious how to do that. And so this is the challenge that we set out to solve. You give me a physical system and I want to tell you how to turn that into a neural network. So one, uh, one perspective we have for this is that if you imagine uh, kind of our favorite MNIST handwritten digit recognition task where we want to put in an image eight and have the system eventually output, this is an eight with high probability, a standard feed forward neural network way of doing this could be written kind of like I've shown here, but with slightly different notation than, than you normally see, which is that there are multiple layers and each layer of the neural network, you have some input output relationship where you put in, in the first layer of the image, it does some processing and then it outputs and then that gets fed to the next layer and so on and so on. And typically what's in this gray box uh, in a conventional artificial neural network is a matrix vector multiplication and element wise nonlinearity. And the matrix vector multiplication is parameterized by some weight matrix. And our thinking was, why does this have to be a matrix vector multiplication with element-wise nonlinearity? Why can you not do something way more general? So imagine inside of this gray box, instead of that, we put a physical system and we feed parameters and data into the physical system. We let it evolve for some time. And then we take the output of that system and we feed that into the next box and the next box and so on and so on. And so basically we propose to construct deep neural networks from a series of physical systems. And what might these physical systems be? Well, it could be anything, but uh, you could imagine multi-mode mechanical oscillators. You could imagine optical systems, both nonlinear optical and linear optical systems. You could imagine electronic circuits that are not 
uh, designed and, uh, and operated to do, perform digital logic, but are behaving as complex dynamical systems themselves. So this was this is what we sort of set out to do: is say, well, can we can we try and construct deep neural networks in this way and train the parameters that we have of each box such that we get the answers that we want? And this this might sound a little crazy. So why why might you think this has even any hope of working? And something that was certainly inspirational to me, but perhaps others in my group as well, uh, was work from the neural ODE literature. And the, the kind of key set of results that were inspirational to us were the following, is that uh, a very prominent uh, image processing neural network architecture from five or six years ago was ResNet, which was a, a very deep feed forward neural network. And this, uh, at the time, achieved state-of-the-art performance in uh, ImageNet competition. And this looks, uh, it's, it's drawn in, the, in kind of a funny way, but essentially it's just a feed forward neural network that has many, many layers plus these kind of skip connections. And this was something that, uh, that, that might look like it's completely different from a physical system. But there is a very interesting set of work. Uh, Wine and E was certainly one of the pioneers of this, but other people have worked on it as well. Uh, where they managed to, to show that actually, if you look at what's going on in something like ResNet, where it has many, many layers, uh, an applied math or a, a numerical algorithms kind of person may look at this and go, you add more, as you add more layers, it gets more accurate. Where else do we have this kind of phenomenon? This looks kind of like if you have a dynamical system governed by some system of ODEs or PDEs, where you're discretizing it. And as you discretize more and more finely, you get more and more accurate. And actually, we we're able, able to show a direct correspondence between the ResNet uh, architecture as a discretization of this dynamical system shown here. And this result was very inspirational to us because this then suggests that if you can find some analog continuous time dynamical system in the physical world that uh, is governed by these dynamics, then you will have a physical system that naturally implements ResNet. And this is something that kind of just doing that is really difficult to do. And so we're not exactly going out to try and find ResNet in a real physical system, but this gives us the sort of inspiration that if we find dynamical systems, they're not, they might at first glance look like they're totally different from feed forward neural networks, but actually there's this kind of nice connection of the, you can think about them as neural networks as discretizations of, uh, of dynamical systems. So this gave us some hope that this could work. And in a slightly sort of more abstract picture that I've already hinted at, but just to kind of make it even more concrete, we can imagine constructing our system out of uh, these gray boxes, which will be physical systems where we put into it input data, we put in parameters that we can tune and it will give output. And just each of the physical system evolutions, uh, we can think about it abstractly as input output maps. So there's some map to the output Y uh, of the input data X and the parameters data. And we're gonna construct deep neural networks out of this by chaining these functions, just like you, you do in, in the more conventional approaches. So here's an example of a nonlinear optical physical neural network that we have constructed. Um, and the idea here was, can we try and harness uh, nonlinear optics as a uh, physical process that can perform useful computation for us? And in this case, we used the same uh, kind of machine learning task as uh, Shannon we showed in the, near the end of the previous talk of uh, vowel recognition. In this case, we were not feeding in the, uh, the direct spectrum of the vowels, but the so-called formants, which is a little bit of pre-processing that's typically done for this task in the machine learning community. So you send in uh, some spoken vowel information and you're asking the system to make a prediction about which vowel was said. And we would like to get a nonlinear optical system to perform this processing for us. And the way we did this was by constructing a neural network that had five layers where each layer, the heart of each layer was a second harmonic generation process. And the way that one could think about this as an input output map is we're gonna send in light that is, uh, that is a pulse of light that is shaped in, its, in the frequency or wavelength domain that encodes uh, the input data and the parameters. And so we have a laser, it has a broad, broadband spectrum, we send it through a pulse shaper that encodes 
the information about the input data and the parameters in the pulse. This gets sent through an SHG crystal where uh, nonlinear optical transformation takes place. And then we put it onto a spectrometer to read out the output. And then that gets fed in to the next layer and the next layer and the next layer and so on. And at each layer, the parameters, just like in a standard neural network, the parameters are different at each layer so that this ultimately can be made to work. So this is something that one could attempt to do, but a problem one will naturally kind of come up against of trying to do this is that if you train the system and these parameters on a computer beforehand, and then try to just put it into hardware and see what happens, your model of what will go on in this nonlinear optical experiment will be a little bit inaccurate, and then that will cause large inaccuracy in the, in the results you get. So you will struggle to train this kind of setup to perform the machine learning task if you try to train it on a computer first and then run it in the hardware. The alternative, or an alternative, is you can try to do all the training on the hardware itself. Um, but we would really like to be able to do back propagation. And the reason for that is that we would like to be able to train every parameter of the system with a single pass through the system. And if we do a naive approach where we fiddle each parameter one at a time and see how that affects the output, we would be able to train the system, but it would be very slow. So we were, part of the sort of success of deep learning is the back propagation algorithm, which lets you train all the parameters in parallel uh, with a single pass through and single back, forward and backward pass through the system. So we really want to be able to use backprop, but it's not clear how to do that with a physical system. So we had two kind of key ideas or concepts that we combined in order to make a training procedure that would work for this kind of physical system. One is that in order to let us do backprop, we're going to have to run gradient descent backprop algorithm on a, uh, on, a, on a digital computer. And so we need a digital model of our experiment uh, so that backprop has something to sort of act on. <laughs> and the second is that we need to do something where we can sort of correct for the fact that the digital model is not perfect. And so the procedure uh, for a single layer shown here just for simplicity, but this generalizes to multiple layers is the following. If we have some parameters and we have some input uh, that we can initialize, we send it into the physical system, which in the case of the previous slide was the nonlinear optical setup and perform some computation produces an output. And then on a digital computer, we can compute what is the difference between the output that this system gave us and what we wanted, because we know what answer we want during the training phase. We know that we put in an eight, so we want the, the eighth bin here to be high. So we can exactly compute what the error between the physical system's output and the desired answer is, and compute an error vector, which is subtract them. Then we can send that back through uh, back propagate that through a digital model of the physical system. Uh, and th this is really enabled by this kind of beautiful set of work that's happened over the last five to 10 years of producing open, so open source tools that are very easy to use where you can do, uh, do use differentiable programming and essentially automatically differentiate any function you can, almost any function you can give, give it. So we can put in a very complex model and have it produce uh, or perform back propagation with that and produce a gradient. So this is all happening, this part kind of here is all happening in the laptop. It produces a gradient and then we use that to update the parameters. And then we, then we kind of cycle through this. We now send the new set of parameters through the physical system again, we get a new uh, output, we have a computer new error vector and we, we kind of iterate. So this, this setting is one where we can train the system using backpropagation, but where we involve the physical system in the forward pass to try and ground the training in reality so that we don't wander off into a weird part of parameter space that, it, that where the model thinks things should be working well, but the physical system doesn't actually work well. We can avoid that. And so th this uh, plot at the below here uh, is actually experimental data from us using uh, the nonlinear optical setup I showed on the previous slide to perform vial classification, where the y-axis is the classification accuracy of how accurately do we characterize the different vowels that we could feed into the system as a function of the training epoch. So how many training steps are going through the, data, the training data set that we do. 
And what was happening here was that we were trained it in two different ways, which is why they're two different curves. So the blue curve is using this so-called physics aware training procedure, which I just described here. And then the alternative, the black curve is from doing something where you just train everything on the laptop and then only at the end in the inference part, do you uh, run the, the, the data through the hardware. And what we see is that the black curve, you basically never get better than random guessing. And that's because the training procedure just doesn't produce good parameters for the real physical hardware because the, 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 the digital model is not accurate enough. But if you use this uh, physics aware training protocol where you do forward passes through the real physical system, you end up getting above 90% accuracy in this task, which is pretty reasonable performance for this. So this, uh, th this shows that this procedure can in principle work and that on at least some simple task it works and that it was necessary because if you didn't do it, you would get poor performance. So we tried this to apply this procedure to a slightly more difficult task, which was handwritten digit classification, for example, putting in your eight and having it tell you it's an eight. And we did this with three different physical systems to try and show the generality of the pro approach. So these were all done in experiment. You can see, you can see for example, here's a mechanical one where we have a, 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 literally a sheet of metal attached to a speaker uh, that this, you can think about this as a multi-mode mechanical oscillator. Uh, this gets shaken by the speaker and then there's a microphone to capture the output. Uh, and you can see that we were able to train this uh, three-layer neural network uh, to get reasonable performance on this. It's a, a brown 90%, a little bit above 90% accuracy. Then we used a, uh, did the same thing for a very simple electronic circuit. This was an RLC oscillator with the transistor added in. So it's, uh, the, where the transistor has been added to provide nonlinearity. Uh, and again, in this case, we were able to train a slightly different neural network architecture and uh, achieve greater than 90% accuracy. And this is uh, kind of something to emphasize is that, I mean, th this circuit was done, uh, built by Logan in his uh, apartment during COVID times. You can see here that uh, no disrespect to Logan's circuit skills, this looks like something that maybe a high school student did. This is not a sophisticated circuit that you would look at and say, an electrical engineer spent three years designing something to exactly implement a neural network. It's, uh, it's four discrete components and two wires. That's, that's kind of it. And yet this is able to perform MNIST handwritten digit classification by taking advantage of the complex dynamics of a, a nonlinear oscillator circuit. Uh, so it's, uh, it's kind of remarkable that this can even work. And then the third example is the nonlinear optical setup that I showed you the sort of larger, more detailed view of in a previous slide. Uh, it's the same system again, but now instead of doing vowel classification, we did it with, uh, used it to do handwritten digit classification. Uh, and in this case, we actually added, uh, we did a slightly more sophisticated architecture uh, where we have a digital layer to begin with that does a, a linear layer at the start and then two rounds of physical uh, layer. And this gets to a question that was asked uh, near the end of the previous talk about, well, can you do something with a physical system and then also have a, a digital neural network on the end of it. Um, we didn't do the digital neural network on the end here. Uh, we did it at the start, but basically the, the, the kind of key message I would like to give about that point is that this procedure of physics aware training is general and you can use different physical systems, including a laptop running matrix vector multiplication counts as a physical system too. So you can slot that in wherever you would like and you can make hybrid architectures that optimize overall for what's the best place to do the different parts of the computation. And this is an example of it where we were kind of separating the computation between a linear layer at the start and then a couple of physical layers. And in this case, with this more sophisticated architecture, we were able to achieve 97% accuracy uh, in this nonlinear optical plus a little bit of digital uh, input layer setting. So these are all simple examples. And MNIST is, of course, far from sort of state-of-the-art, most difficult machine learning tasks. So kind of a natural sort of future direction for us is what physical system should we use to build physical neural networks? Like we're, we're in production, we definitely don't want to use this breadboard with these four discrete components. Um, and mechanics is a nice visual example, but mechanics tends to be slow. So for most things, you probably don't want to do that, although there might be situations where that's useful. Uh, so what, what system should you use? Um, and we're very interested in exploring different options, uh, just to put up sort of three, one, three ones as random examples to sort of simulate 
uh, some thinking about it is you could imagine using uh, spintronics, you could imagine using superconducting electronics, you could imagine even something like exciton dynamics and 2D materials, um, but essentially any physical system that is difficult to simulate on your laptop uh, is potentially a good candidate. And we've made available our code to do the, the training. So if you would like to try it out on your own, uh, you can download the code and give it a try, uh, but we're also welcome are also welcome to reach out to us. We're very happy to collaborate with people who would like to try to apply this approach to, to, different, uh, uh, to different physical systems. So that's the, that's the main part of the talk. But before I, uh, I end, I wanted to spend uh, 10 minutes or so telling you about something that is, is kind of much more uh, standard, uh, but that we're also very interested in. I'm excited about, which is the development of optical neural networks where you can use a really, really small amount of light to operate them. Uh, so in particular, we can use less than one photon per weight multiplication. And uh, in this part of the talk, essentially, we're going to be talking about constructing a neural network that accelerator that has uh, as, or, is in the taxonomy of exact and approximate equivalence. This is one we're aiming for the exact equivalence. And this work was led by another postdoc in my group, Tianyu Wang, and he was assisted by a junior PhD student, uh, Xi Yuan Ma. So as, uh, as Shanghai mentioned in his talk, there's been a lot of interest in optical matrix vector multipliers, even though this goes back to the 1970s. Um, this, there's been a sort of resurgence of interest. Uh, this slide here is from Dirk England's group, and Shanghai talked about his, his group's work with Marin Solyacic, on, uh, on chip matrix vector multipliers. And there's also the free space approach, which again also Shanghai mentioned and discussed uh, the, some of the history of this with uh, Joe Goodman. And there are many other uh, approaches as well, but suffice to say there are ways to produce matrix vector multipliers in optics. There are quite a few of them. These are just two categories. There's sort of some hybrids as well. Um, and they each take advantage of sort of the, some, some common, but sometimes different features of light that would lead you to believe you could ultimately get an energy or a speed advantage or both by doing matrix vector multiplication in optics. And so we're, uh, we're, we're interested in both on-chip and free space systems, but the particular work I'll tell you about here is using uh, free space optics. And our construction of a matrix vector multiplier is gonna be very similar to the Goodman scheme, but with a little twist on it, which is that we start with a vector that is uh, represented here uh, on the left-hand side by these four pixels, where each color is not meant to tell you about the color of the wavelength of light, it's just to, to help you follow the elements of the matrix of the vector. So th this is an example for a four-dimensional vector. And the first stage is you, would, you should fan out your vector and make multiple copies of it. And then you propagate these, these copies of the vector uh, forward in space through a modulator that in, modulates the intensity of the pixels. And it's the spatial light modulator that encodes the matrix that you're going to multiply by. <coughs> Excuse me. And then uh, you, you have all these sort of element-wise multiplications, these scalar multiplications that have been performed. You now need to collapse them and fan in uh, to compute the vector vector dot products. And this can be done by having a a, a, an array of lenses where each lens collects, in this case, four pixels onto a single detector. And so if you, you can perform matrix vector multiplication optically in this way. And a question is, well, how many photons do you need for this to work? And the intuition um, that we have for this is that you would like your detector to receive many photons so that your signal to noise ratio is good. So that each detector here needs to receive lots of photons. And that, what does that mean for the number of photons you need for each of these kind of individual scalar multiplications that happen? Well, uh, if you have a small number of, of beams going in, then you needed each of these beams to have a large number of photons. However, if you are fanning in a very large number of spatial modes to a single detector, you can have a situation where you receive many photons at the detector, but each mode individually that corresponds to a single uh, weight multiplication could have had less than one photon on average in it. And this is a fact that has been pointed out in a couple of theoretical works recently and basically means you can perform subphoton per multiplication 
operations in optics, so long as the vector size is large enough, you need to make the vector size n large. And so that's what we set out to do is try and build an optical matrix vector multiplier having this architecture where we had a very large vector size. Um, and we constructed the, city, the, the system with an OLED display to, to display our vectors, a spatial light modulator to encode uh, the matrices. The first thing we did was vector vector our products, then we will get to matrix vector products, and then uh, lens to collapse and, uh, and a, a detector for the measurement of vector vector dot product results. And this is something we constructed in our lab. Uh, it's this photograph, not too much for you to get from other than to emphasize this is a real experiment. We did the experiment. Um, and here are, the, here are some of the results. So the first thing we did, like I said, is perform vector vector dot products. Um, and this plot here shows on the y-axis the error for a vector vector dot product average over many different combinations of vectors so that we could test how well it was working in general. Uh, as a function of the basically the optical power we used in the system. Um, and the scale has been kind of arranged so that it, it tells you how many photons there were per scalar multiplication. And some interesting things to note here. First of all, if you, this red point here is a very relevant one, this is at the one photon per scalar multiplication level. So if you have one photon per scalar multiplication, you have an error much less than 1%, which we were very satisfied with. Um, and this is not 64-bit floating point arithmetic level, but this is definitely well within the sort of error range that's acceptable for neural network computations. And you can see that the, the x-axis here is a log scale. Um, so as we go to the left, we're going through orders of magnitude lower photon counts. And this blue point here represents 6% error in vector vector dot product computations even though we we're only using a thousandth of a photon per scalar multiplication. And the reason that this worked is that the vector size was very large. Uh, the vector sizes here were a little bit above 500,000, corresponding to 500,000 pixels on the SLM and 500,000 pixels on the phone. And uh, it's, it's, it's this large vector size that has enabled this. If you tried to do this with vector sizes of uh, 100, you would not be able to get good accuracy at the subphoton per multiplication level. Uh, and we, we characterize what happened as a function of the vector size. And indeed, as the vector size gets smaller, the error grows larger. So this gives you some kind of bound on the energy consumption that an optical matrix vector mul multiplier could have. And it, it's very promising. It's showing that you, that you can use exceptionally small amounts of optical power. There's an important caveat though, is that if you consider the total energy cost of the system, you need to consider the cost of converting from electronics to optics and back again. And so uh, we're not anywhere near yet the point where we can say that overall the system is beating a laptop in energy efficiency because you need to consider the non-optical parts of the energy consumption and this is also something that has been pointed out by these previous theoretical proposal works. And that is kind of clearly an important goal for the field is how do we improve the energy efficiency of the, the conversion stages? So what is this? Uh, this has been a little bit abstract showing vector vector dot products, promising you that we can turn them into matrix vector products. What is it good for? Well, of course, uh, neural networks. And a very nice feature of neural networks is they were robust to noise. So you can use an optical matrix vector multiplier uh, to perform the propagation of information through the layers of a neural network that is not a perfect matrix vector multiplier. And the neural network will still function reasonably well because neural networks can be trained in a way that is robust to noise. And in practice, even in the electronics community, people are seeing that you can train neural networks with low precision, even four bits of precision or even less. Um, and inference, as you've said, is even though this is only for inference, that's still an important kind of target audience. And this is this kind of whole uh, resurgence of interest in inference processes with relatively low precision matrix vector multiplications has really been, uh, let's say, resuscitated by uh, by this paper from uh, uh, Dirk England and Marin Solisic's groups at MIT that uh, that Shanhui again has has mentioned before. So we used our matrix vector multiplier to perform MNIST handwritten digit classification. And we used a three layer neural network. So going back again to a question from the previous talk, we haven't tried to do this with a hundred layer network yet. We're also in the relatively shallow limit. Um, and 
this is a fairly canonical design. So you have your 28 by 28 pixel image as the input. You have two hidden layers of 100 neurons each, and then 10 uh, neurons in the output layer corresponding to the digits 0 through 9. And whichever of these neurons basically lights up the strongest, that's the digit. Uh, and we, we used uh, our matrix vector, optical matrix vector multiplier to do the uh, matrix multiplications. And the element-wise nonlinearities were done on a laptop using a, a digital computation. And we characterized the accuracy of MNIST handwritten digit classification on the y-axis here as a function, again, of how many photons we used per scalar multiplication, which in the neural network context, you can think of as like the neuron-neuron connections. How many photons did you need for that? And uh, you can see here that above one photon per multiplication, we can get something with a very high accuracy, uh, like 99% or so. But the most interesting point, I think, data point on this plot, I think, is this one over here, which is that at less than a single photon per multiplication, so in particular, 0.64 photons per multiplication on average, uh, we could achieve an MNIST accuracy of 90%. Uh, so this is really showing that the the neural network robustness is really real, even in the case of the, the particular noise that we have in our optical matrix vector multiplier. And things really do work when you put the whole system together. So with that, um, I'll leave up the, the summary. Um, uh, to recap, uh, the main part that I told you about was our construction of physical neural networks using a, a physics-aware training pr pr protocol that lets you construct deep neural networks uh, from layers of physical systems. And uh, we've done a demonstrations of three different physical systems, but we're looking for more. Uh, and I gave you this quick uh, teaser to our optical matrix vector multiplication work where we were able to show high accuracy using less than a single photon per mo weight multiplication. Uh, so with that, thank you again for, uh, for the invitation to speak and uh, look forward to questions. All right, wonderful. So um, I'm going to be taking over from Vinod. It seems he is uh, having technical difficulties. Um, thank you very much, Peter. This is, uh, was a really wonderful talk. Um, we, uh, we got some questions in the pipeline here. Um, so I don't know the order these have appeared. But maybe we can go with Chan Hui first. Um, he, he has a raised hand. 